but you know we know that that members still value getting that magazine being able to flick through it and i think that there's something still um really important about being able to produce news and content and insight into your particular industry and have that you know on the printed page we try and incorporate our corporate members and our individual members and, and profile them in the magazine and i think there is still something that the members really like about being able to hold something and you see it on a page rather than we're accustomed now to seeing our face on a phone mm. or, or on, on a tablet that having that tangible physical benefit as a professional body there's not many other things that you can actually give someone yeah. and they can actually hold so yeah I think they're, they're extremely important where we'd got to was is we hadn't really kept pace with the changes in the market we thought of ourselves as primarily waste um, and actually it isn't it's about resources uh, making use of resources and all the new technologies and the different ways people work and 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 um, and then we knew all that anyway and then of course came Blue Planet and then all of a sudden everybody on the planet most people I imagine uh, all don't want to waste anything anymore mm. um, and they don't want plastic in the sea and all the rest of it um, so sort of in an instant in one evening the profile of the industry just went through the roof. Welcome to Content Talks brought to you by River Sounds, where we talk about how to get the best out of your content marketing investment. In this episode, we discuss the importance of print magazines for membership organizations and how to create engaging and powerful content. To help tackle this topic, we're joined by Paul Sloggett from the Chartered Institute of Wastes Management and Thomas Moverly, Director of the Institute of Sales Management. Today we're talking magazines. What is the value of, of print for membership organisations? So over 70% of membership organisations have a magazine, um, but are magazines really doing a job for the investment? Today we examine in detail what it takes to create something engaging, ticking all the boxes like retention, data gathering, brand building and communication. We'll also discuss some pitfalls to avoid in creating a, a print magazine for your members. So these guys are the experts. To my left and to my right I've got uh, Paul Sloggett, uh, Head of Member Engagement at the Chartered Institution of Wastes Management and Tom Moverly, uh, Director uh, from the Institute of Sales Management. So thank you gents for getting on board. Thank you for no being problem. here. Thanks very much thank for having you. me. Um, I'm very sorry that we've locked you in this dark room on such a beautiful sunny day, but appreciate your time nonetheless. Um, so we'll start by talking about the, the topic generally. Maybe I'll, I'll start with yourself, Paul. Um, what do you think is so important um, about a magazine or is a magazine important to a membership organisation? Uh, I think it is um, for three very important reasons. Um, the first is a really obvious one that in, in our research and in other member organisations that I've been involved with, it uh, very often comes out as the most valued benefit um, of membership. Um, I think that's because it's really the only physical thing that they get. Um, so it's, and it's top of mind. So that's the answer that they give. Um, but even in that case, you can't really ignore the fact that most members are saying it's the most important thing to them about membership. Um, so it's, it's very valued. Um, it's also, for me, it's the physical manifestation of the brand, if you like. It's actually something tangible that shows mm. off what the organization is all about and sets the tone and the personality for the organization. Um, and uh, lastly, but equally important, is that it uh, really helps us to achieve what we are trying to achieve mm. as a member organization. Um, so we're a professional body. Um, so we have individual members and our, our role really is to empower professionalism so our kind of strap line that we're adopting now is about empowering profession, professionalism in resource management. Mm -hmm. And obviously the information, the knowledge that we share and all the rest of it through the magazine is a really important part of that. Mm. So it's, it's a really important way to um, turn that information into something that your members can hold and, and collect um, as, as part of a, um, something tangible, like you say, yeah, um, exactly about, about your business. Yeah. Uh, 
So Tom, a similar question to you. Um, I mean, you've both you both got membership uh, magazines. So um, for yourself, Tom, what do you think is the primary function of a of a magazine? Yeah, I'm going to unfortunately maybe agree with everything that's been said. Mm -hmm. um, I think the you know the mindset of a member is that they know that every month, every quarter, however often a body develops and, and, and produces a magazine, they're going to get that, that physical, tangible benefit that's going to arrive on their desk through mm -hmm. their door. Um, and I think it's almost, I mean, you mentioned the statistic when you started speaking that 70% of professional bodies have magazines. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought that was quite low. I'm quite surprised that it's only 70%. Um, I guess the 30% the, the who don't must have, you know, an extraordinarily good outreach program in, from their social media mm. or email marketing, whatever it is that, that they do. Um, I think for, for me personally, having, having worked in a couple of professional bodies and, and around professional institutes for the last 10 years or so, um, magazines are, and print, you know, being able to deliver that to people that they can actually read through and look at it. Um, I think there's still a huge place for that and it's a huge benefit to the members. Um, I know a lot of, you know, what we do in this day and age now is digital or I want to be able to access it through my phone or on my iPad. Um, but, you know, we know that, that members still value getting that magazine, being able to flick through it. And I think that there's something still um, really important about being able to produce news and content and insight into your particular industry and have that, you know, on the printed page, um, especially when you do profiles. A lot of stuff that we do in our magazine now is we try and incorporate our corporate members and our individual members and, and profile them in the magazine. And I think there is still something that the members really like about being able to hold something and you see it on a page rather than we're accustomed now to seeing our face on a phone mm. or, or on, on a tablet. Um, and when it's in a magazine, it's, it almost feels like it's there forever then. And you've got that thing. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic way if you, if, if you know what you're trying to achieve in your business, it's a fantastic way of getting your message out there. Um, but for me, it, you know, like, like Paul said, that, that having that tangible physical benefit as a professional body, there's not many other things that you can actually give someone yeah. and they can actually hold. So yeah, I, th I, I think that they're extremely important. So we spoke about profiles um, of within the organisation last time um, and the importance of that. So you think that magazines actually give readers, a, a members a chance to to see who is making this magazine and really uh, give them character? Yeah, I, I think what's, I think in terms of, I mean, obviously it depends on what, on what the business is trying to achieve through its magazine and what its marketing strategy is, but huge benefits to the, to a a stakeholder, whether it be a corporate or an individual, and then from the business to be able to say that you know we profile our partners, we mm -hmm. we elevate their um, exposure, <clears throat> we bring awareness to the work that they're doing or the, the success of this individual. Mm -hmm. um, that can help the business in in going on and, and getting buy in from you know other partners yeah. and other other customers. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think yeah. It's a, mm. good, it's a good platform for that. Fantastic. I think on that point about 70%, uh, only 70% have got a magazine, mm. um, just as my observation on that is that um, I think there is quite possibly a lot of member organisations out there who wish they still did have a magazine. Mm. And yeah. I think they've cl there's quite a few have closed them over mm. the years as money saving or whatever. Um, and I worked, I did some work for the Direct Marketing Association at one time. Mm. And the guy who was running that was absolutely desperate to have a magazine back, but he didn't have a budget to do it. No. And I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. I, I mean, it, it has, it's never too far from my thinking at the moment. You know, if, if we lay our cards on the table, I, a magazine with a certain quality about it is not the cheapest thing that an organization is going to spend its money on in, mm. in each calendar year. Um, and it's very easy to just say, well, there's X amount of savings here. Let's just cut that um, and see if, see if there is any or deal with it. But as, as Paul rightly said, the moment you get rid of it, it's very difficult to get that back because yeah. um, then you have to sort of find the money and immediately you'll go and reinvest that money mm. elsewhere. Um, it, it has cost cost my mind quite a bit, but it's 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 that you know they're a staple. The other interesting statistic would be that of the seventy percent who do have a magazine, 
I suspect that quite a high percentage of those people have more than one. I've been at, in my, my, in my previous role, um, the organization I worked for, um, had at least three, or mm. four different magazines, regular magazines. Wow. Covering different, you know, one was purely for partners. So we mm -hmm. created what we call partner news, which was purely for the partners, the corporates, um, and then the education institutes as well. Then there was one that was put together about the, the, the overall industry. And mm -hmm. then there was another one that was put together for the younger generation. So school leavers, even, even like secondary school and, and primary school people as well, to give them a more interesting element to what that industry had to sort of drive engagement in thinking about at the time when it was an engineering body working in engineering as a career. So they were doing more than one magazine trying to cover so many different areas and, and you know, they, they were they were really, really popular. There's so much content, isn't it? Do you think that perhaps people, uh, organisations have stopped making their magazines because of the sort of foreboding beast of digital they can see in the future and think, oh, this is going to take over, print is, is going to die, so I'm going to get rid of it. And then obviously it hasn't. People still want that sort of collectible, tangible thing. Is it digital that has forced it out of a lot of membership organisations? I think it probably happened before digital for some. Um, and I think it was probably about saving money. Yeah, because it is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think digital. In in our case, we were looking at what we were going to do with our magazine because of the cost mm. some while ago last year, and the trustees wanted a digital instead, uh, a digital offering instead, um, and it took quite a bit of arguing. The, po the point of the value of the magazine and, you know, it is at the top of the members' benefits list. Mm. And um, we were able to, in fact, save some money um, by taking it down from a monthly to a six-monthly. Um, and then we're launching a new, um, new website alongside that as well with the same branding. Um, so we actually saved a bit of money. Um, and we also reinvested some back into going, um, making the magazine as sustainable as possible. Because obviously our members uh, are very interested in not wasting anything. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so you've relaunched the magazine, and so that that relaunch was uh, the bi-monthly magazine. Yeah. Um, so the the primary reason for for you relaunching was financial. Um, well. Yes and no. Okay. Uh, I don't think that f the financial was was the main driver of it. Um, I mean, just if I just give you a bit of background to the industry and stuff. Um, so many years ago, the waste industry basically was you dig a hole in the ground, you go and collect the waste, you put it in the ground, and then eventually after many decades, you bury it. Um, and th that's what we've done for many, many years. Um, obviously, uh, that still goes on today, but a much less, uh, you know, far mm -hmm. less of it. Um, and the idea is that everything gets reused, recycled, etc., because the world's resources are limited. So, um, you know, the, they're, they're running out, the fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not in the not too distant future that things will start running out, you know, um, Absolutely. finite, finite amount of resources. So it's changed massively into, um, recycling, reuse, energy from waste, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's really important that your members see that you're on board with that and that yeah. you're tackling those issues, exactly. especially through the content that they're receiving. Exactly that. But, the, but where we, where we'd got to was, is we hadn't really kept pace with the changes in the market. Mm. So I would describe it as we are a little bit behind the curve. Mm. So we, 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 we thought of ourselves as primarily waste. Um, and actually it isn't, it's about resources. Uh, and making use of resources and all the new technologies and the different ways people work and, and, and. Um, and then we knew all that anyway. And then, of course, came Blue Planet. And all of a sudden, everybody on the planet 
most people, I imagine, uh, all don't want to waste anything anymore. Mm. Um, and they don't want plastic in the sea and all the rest of it. Um, so sort of in an instant, in one evening, the profile of the industry just went through the roof wow. in a sense um, because these are the guys that have to deal with all of that mm. um, and come up with the new technologies and inventions and all the systems and all mm. that kind of thing to deal with it um, and uh, it's still probably hidden to most people and I, mean, I started from a completely different career I started with CRWM um, five years ago I had no idea about waste whatsoever I mm. still don't really um, but uh, all of a sudden I began seeing the whole infrastructure and it's massive and everybody who's walked here today will have walked past um, sort of uh, bins and uh, you know outside offices and mm. all that kind of thing possibly uh, lorries collecting waste etc etc and no one noticed um, it's kind of, of course, white noise to most when, people. When you, when, you get, when you get into it, you, you start noticing this huge oh, industry that's going imagine. on behind the scenes, which nobody really wants to see because mm. it's a bit messy. Mm. Um, so anyway, cutting a long story short, we, we decided to relaunch and reposition the magazine as part of relaunching and repositioning the whole organization right. um, to, to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gone down really, really well. So, um, so this was, this was our old magazine, uh, which you can see is quite, and I don't know how you'd describe it, but it's, it's a bit basic. Mm -hmm. It's a bit dull. It's primarily waste focused. Absolutely. It looks uh, quite corporate for those who aren't watching this and are listening yeah. to the podcast. <laughs> um, I'll just hold this up for the, for the camera though. Here we go. So this is the, the first, uh, first version of the CI uh, WM magazine. And it served us well for many years. Yeah. Um, but um, what, what we wanted to do uh, was, was broaden our remit. So I don't know if, if you've heard of the phrase circular economy. Mm -hmm. um, circular economy is the big thing in our industry. The whole industry runs around the circular economy, which essentially means from the very stages of design, you design out waste and you make sure that it's reusable, recyclable, using the minimum amount of resources, using um, resources that are already recycled, whatever, all the way around the system through retail and everything else and back into the system. So resources are continually, I mean, there's a whole kind of science around mm. this, continually used forever. And it's called the circular economy. So when we were looking at the title of uh, our new magazine, we came up with the idea of calling it Circular. Wow. Um, Look at that. And what was so bizarre was that actually nobody had used Circular on a magazine before. We were quite stunned. Um, and actually, it's it, uh, not trademarked either. So pretty. we have now have a trademark application in, which is pretty amazing. I mean, a bit of luck, really. Um, but as you can see, that's a completely different ball game. So this is now, this is now printed on 100% recycled paper. Mm. Um, which is very difficult to get hold of, but we've managed to get hold of it f for the last few issues. Um, and we also, in, in this particular issue, part of our story was to be a bit more bold. And uh, so we decided that we'd go and see if Michael Gove would mm -hmm. talk to us. Uh, even though we're a tiny uh, um, charity and professional body, uh, he agreed to talk to us. So there's a there's a feature in him Fantastic. from Michael Gove. So that was a bit of a, a bit of a good way to launch. And how many times a year did you say this magazine's coming out? It comes out? out six times now. Six times a year. Yeah. And we've obviously reinvested in making sure it's... Uh, as sustainable mm. as we possibly can. But a fantastic example as to how the entire shift of the business spearheaded by having that magazine and being able to get that voice out there and, and champion that change. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it looks fantastic as well. I mean, the, mm. the design development is for our listeners. Um, is there anywhere that our listeners can... can see this magazine other than there are digital versions on on uh, our website okay um, so look up circular magazine check it out it's a fantastic fantastic design uh, i'm very excited to read about michael gove's brave new world as well um so the question for for both of you really um how do you get feedback from your members about your print magazines and, and what are your members saying we've um not to such an extent but probably about 12, 18 months ago, we started looking at the content of Winning Edge 
which is a, which is the magazine that the ISM produce. Um, and we we ran we ran a series of um, I guess questionnaires to members um, trying to pick up some data. We did an awful lot of it through the meetings that we went to or the mm. phone calls that came in. Always just asking a simple question. Very aware that a lot of people get a lot of stuff now. You know, a lot of emails, a lot of surveys, um, and the general consensus was that they wanted to see a bit more about what was going on internally, not just in the industry. You know. It's very easy to forget, I think, sometimes as a membership body or professional body that you exist mm -hmm. for your members. I mean, it's, it might not be a Coca-Cola or a Mercedes, but you exist for your members. And we needed to give them more of what they wanted. And, and Winning Edge has started to, to change slightly to tell people a little bit more about what's going on within mm. the membership and that, that ISM community. Um, we have, we produce four magazines a year. Um, three which are specifically around the sales industry, um, latest trends, news, thinking. Um, we've got we've done quite a bit on mental health and stress in sales of late. Um, something that no one really talks about. As, mm. You know, we had was it Mental Health Awareness Week? It was last, last week. week, yeah. Um, there's obviously a huge topic at the moment. And then we run a fourth edition towards the back end, sort of November, December time, which purely focuses on, um, the, um, BESMA awards that we run on an annual mm -hmm. basis as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and that really just shows members exactly what the culmination of the, of the last 12 months has been and the success of the membership and, um, the people that are recognized who win those awards. But, um, you know, again, we've had to change it to reflect exactly what the members are wanting to see and wanting to mm. know and wanting to hear about. Um, and again, I guess a little bit like what Paul said, it's you know, sales as an industry is, it's, it's vast. If you, if you were able to produce a piece of information for every facet of the, of the you know, you're going to, you're going to be delivering a magazine on the back of a lorry. Mm. It is going to be huge. So it's extremely important for us that we're picking up on the, on the key points and the key topics at any given point when this magazine goes to print and I'm sure as you found you can have an idea of you can plan out what it's going to look like for the year and then two months before one's due to go live something in the world happens and mm -hmm. you've got to try and change because you want to sort of you know lead that that knowledge to those to those members so um we yeah we we make sure that we communicate and we talk to and we gather information from our members wherever possible to better understand what it is that they want in their magazine mm. I mean, it sounds like um, that your magazines can, you put so much into the print. I mean, the content sounds fantastic, mm. covering mental health and mm. um, it, and as well with, with the um, you know, sustainability of, of, of Circular. It sounds like the, the print, uh, making these print magazines and creating your own memberships and developing your own membership organisations, they can kind of change each other. I mean, knowing what your members want from... Uh, your your magazines uh, might influence the way you you both operate within your organisations. I think, for me personally, I think the magazine, as you, as we said right at the start, you know, it's a tangible, it's a physical benefit, and I think it's got to set the standard for the content and the knowledge that you deliver to your members. Mm -hmm. I think if I think if you're gonna, ha there's, you can't have a magazine, in my opinion, and not make it as good as it can be because otherwise it is like you said it, it is just a complete waste of money and maybe why there's 30 percent of of those professional bodies out there who don't have one because they weren't making the most of it used mm -hmm. in the right way people can look at it and say oh you know it's, it's x amount of money a year we can save that the other way of looking at it is it could generate x amount of money a year if you've got a good membership base it's a, and and you know that you're you can guarantee that it's going to land in front of your members every other month, four times a month, every mm -hmm. month, however, however many times it is, you know, for a professional body, there is a potential revenue generation tool there as well. So it goes beyond just the content and the knowledge. It can mm. support the it can support the professional body as a whole because it's something that like we said it's tangible and people are going to hold it in their hands and see this. Um, so there's you know there's multiple benefits to mm. to having a magazine and doing it properly. Absolutely. So why did um the print magazine event uh, starts. Why did why did you you create the magazine? Not even I am arrogant enough to to claim that I created the magazine for the ISM. <laughs> um, I think I think when any professional body starts, 
obviously there would have been someone way back when who said, you know what, we need to get our news out. And that was probably over you know, hundreds of years ago, probably now. Um, and then as other professional bodies have emerged, as bigger bodies have broken down, I think when they look, you look at setting up a magazine, um, even if you don't have your own, I suspect you can, you, a lot of organizations will be partnering with someone mm. to give their members something. Um, and I think it's just, I, I think it is just commonplace. I think it's just what, you know, there's the, there's the professional recognition through post nominal letters, which a lot of bodies offer. There's qualifications and training, there's events, and then there's a magazine and, and, and those things are pretty synonymous with what you expect from a professional body. Mm -hmm. There's obviously an awful lot of other stuff that goes in around that and the nuances around, you know, your newsletters and all the little bits and the networking and all the rest of it, but, um, and supporting the industry and promoting the industry as, as a profession. But I think the magazine sits in that top bracket of if, if, you, if you're going to sit down and say, I'm going to start, I'm going to start a brand new professional body. One of the things that in, in on your wish list would be that you could have a magazine to produce mm -hmm. news and, and, and give to people. So they have that tangible benefit because in a, in a, in an industry like we like I keep saying in an industry where there's very little tangible stuff to hold mm -hmm. you get a magazine it's extremely important yeah. absolutely so a question again to, to both of you maybe we'll, we'll start with Paul um what is the most important lesson this might be a difficult question for you might uh, what is the most important lesson that you've learnt uh, from developing a print magazine uh I think we had a, a few lessons um recently with obviously with the relaunch mm -hmm. Um, I think we had to be brave, um, and, uh, sort of challenge the whole way that we were doing things. Um, and so we, we, we looked at the size, the paper, absolutely every aspect, the content, exactly what was going in it, etc. Um, and we're quite brave in the way we changed it, I think. So that, that was, that was quite important. Um, Going down from 12 to six issues was a good bit of learning because it nearly went <laughs> because of money. Um, and it, that was an, an, an easy fix. Um, in the case of circular, the other thing that we, we learned by going, uh, by trying to be sustainable was how difficult it is to get hold of recycled paper, bizarrely, that it's good enough quality. Really? Really, really difficult. Uh, so there was, there's about two mills in Europe that have, were bringing paper into this country, recycled paper. Um, one of them has just gone into liquidation, which oh, doesn't blimey. help. But, no. um, and the other thing was, this is the interesting thing, um, was our members uh, hate packaging. Uh, mm. And we always sent it out in a plastic bag and constantly... Ever since I've been there, they've moaned about that, mm. uh, as, as you can imagine. Mm. Um, and so we had a look at compostable wrap as an, as an op option to go with compostable wrap. Um, and what we learned there was that actually compostable wrap is potentially worse than plastic um, because uh, it takes a very long time to compost down. If you put it into an AD plant, it will, it won't compost down because it won't, it's not, it's too fast a process for it mm. to compost. Mm -hmm. So it gets skimmed off and taken to landfill. Uh, and if you put it in with your plastic bags at a supermarket, one wrapper in the big bin of plastic bags means that none of those bags can be recycled. It's called contamination and they will all go and be put in landfill. Oh, wow. Um, so it's not as as good a solution as it first may seem. Mm. Now, in certain circumstances, yes, it will compost down over a long period of time and all the rest of it, but you have to deal with it very carefully mm -hmm. um, in, in order for it to do that. So that wasn't an option. So we were quite brave again, and we decided to go naked. <laughs> so we now have no packaging at all. Um, and this one we sent out, it goes out to about five and a half thousand members, um, you can overseas. And we asked them to tell us if it arrived in good condition. And we only had two people say that it didn't. Oh, so actually that was a, another 
big learning curve mm. for us that you can actually by just being brave you mm. can actually give it a go yeah. <laughs> you know and 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 try it um, and you never learn we did learn that not having tried it no um you couldn't possibly imagine that being the contamination of, of plastic bags and things like that not things you would consider well, i didn't know about that before you know i was looking mm. from a normal human being's yeah, perspective and then all of a sudden the, the guys in the office and some of our members just said don't don't mm. do it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, local councils hate it um, because it's so difficult for them to deal with. Mm. Wow! Um, but people just throw it in with the with the recycling and you know put it in, and it's obviously yeah, not think about it. Yeah. No, yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, well, Tom, the same question to to yourself. And what is the most important lesson that you've learned from uh, developing uh, and running a print magazine for your members? I think the most important lesson that we've learned, and I touched on it a minute ago, is making sure that if you're going to commit to to, to running a magazine, that mm. you're doing it properly and you're giving people what they what they want. I think it's, you know, some of the arguments that that I've heard from other bodies, you know, it doesn't get the engagement. People don't actually read it. We're sending mm. all these magazines out, and they probably don't look at them. So the one thing, and it might be, it might be, it it might well be the most obvious thing is you need to make sure that if in my opinion, if you've got a magazine, then you are hitting all the key topics. You are understanding exactly what your members want and mm -hmm. you are providing them with that information um, to really make, you know, your investment worthwhile. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you you spend a lot of money on anything. You want to make sure that you're getting the most out of it and you get your value for money and it's doing what it should do. You know, a magazine's no different. It shouldn't just write itself and it's not a, you know, get it done, get it well, not packaged in your case, but get it, get it, <laughs> get it posted. Um, so yeah, mine is, you know, really understanding what the content of your magazine mm -hmm. has to be and understanding who is driving that content. And it's not, you know, I'm very, I'm a very strong believer that professional bodies and industry bodies, you know, decisions about what the members get shouldn't be made solely in the building. Mm -hmm. Those decisions need to come from what you're told by the membership base. Um, most, I, I suspect most successful organizations will do it in the same way. I'm, I'm sure that in some areas, companies like Apple will make sure that when they develop their next iPhone, they're listening to what the people, and you've seen it in phones, you know, people, a phone, it's, phone's not a phone anymore, is it? You know, people don't want to make phone calls on their phone. They mm. want to take pictures and videos and send and send data and media so you know they've listened to what people want and professional bodies are no different you understand what your customers want and that's what you then produce mm -hmm. and i think that's the biggest the biggest thing that that we've we've discovered over the last couple of years and certainly if, if i'm talking to anyone who's talking about or wanting to set up and create a magazine what they need to do understand who that magazine's for and what they want in that magazine not what you think should be in that magazine absolutely uh, i completely agree and as you guys have found out your members, they want to know what's going on with you and they want to know what yeah. you're up to and they want to, they see you as the industry, so they want to hear your stories. And again, you, you, you see the benefits of that and, and the knock-on effects to you as a business that all of a sudden if you're, if you're doing more promotion for your partners and your members and you're <clears throat> talking about internal success stories within your membership community, other people then want to get involved and they want, they want to share their success so you know, the business can really benefit from it. And um, there is a huge difference. I don't... I almost don't care what anyone says. I mean, there is a there is a difference to having something in your hand, a printed story about you know your you know a personal journey. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had our members who who've done you know charity bike rides or runs, um, and it is there is still something. It might, maybe it's romantic, I don't know, but there is still something that people enjoy about having that on paper mm -hmm. in their hand than there is about logging on putting a password in and, and opening a PDF. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. It's that sort of temporal element of digital versus mm. that sort of being able to collect something and have yeah. something in, in your hand. I think it might uh, also um, be something that people, it makes people feel they belong to something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they've, they, this, is, this is mine. This is my organisation that I belong to. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I totally every single thing now you can get you can get on your phone. Absolutely, there's not a lot you can't. You know, every nearly everything that you need is accessible. Mm -hmm. You know, I did it here. First thing I did, got out the tube station, Google Maps, just quickly. It's almost habit now. 
Mm. And, you know, you read magazines and I get most of my information about personal interests through my phone, whether it's on a sports app or a social media mm -hmm. site or whatever it might be. And um, I think if you were to go purely the same route with a magazine, it would just become something else that people eventually just get a little bit out of. Absolutely. It's nice to keep it there. So, yeah. Yeah. It would take away what is special in, in print, I agree. Mm. Um, which is a good sort of segue into the digital world. I mean, what mm -hmm. kind of value do you both see in, in digital for your member organisations? Uh, I think for us, it's a, it's a mixture of a magazine and the digital side. Mm -hmm. So we have what you'd probably call a brochure website, which is all about CIWM and becoming a member and all that kind of thing. Um, we also have a site um, which was linked to our previous journal, mm -hmm. uh, which is a news site. So we're uploading, uploading news and some features and stuff on a daily basis. And... Um, we're relaunching that because, again, it had gone a bit out of date um, and it's going to be called Circular Online. Um, and what we're adding to that is a knowledge hub mm -hmm. that is mostly accessible only to members. So you've got to sign in to see that information. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we think that's going to be really important to us. Um, one of the things that we're, we're doing is um, creating a professional pathway or recreating the professional pathway that we have um, and the competencies that people need to go th you know in to be professional mm -hmm. and acknowledged as professional and we see both the magazine and the digital the new digital site as pretty core to that mm -hmm. because it will help to develop those competencies mm -hmm. in people and hopefully get them through and become chartered and you know boost their careers and and all the rest of it so i think digital and print side by side you know and, and with the emails as well and mm -hmm. the newsletters uh, yeah that sort of thing i think you just gotta i mean this is this is this is gonna sound like a very easy get out i think you have a responsibility to make sure you're covering every area and i think people want you know as long as it's not the same stuff over and over again mm -hmm. um and you know, you're not sending them a magazine then you're emailing them a copy of the magazine and then your newsletters are direct content from the magazine um People still, they want to have snapshots of information. They want to know what's out there. Um, and sometimes, you know, you want, I'll go back to what I said about the magazine, you need to elevate that to, to, mm. to provide something different than the day-to-day -day communications that people get. Because again, information is accessible 24-7, wherever you are. Mm. Um, and you're always going to be competing in that world. With a yeah, you are. Um, and again, it, it brings us all the way back. I know you're trying to move away from the print, but, you know, your magazine is that stand aside thing that unless mm. you're a member of a body or in our case, or most professional bodies, unless you've attended an event or an exhibition and you've picked one up off the stand and spoken to someone in the organization, no one else gets that information unless mm. they're a member of that body. And that's, you know, I think that's quite a good thing for a professional body to be able to offer. Absolutely. So, I mean, it sounds like really digital and, and print are kind of as, as important as one another. They just sort of serve. I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't think, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, people, you know, if you, people talk about, when we spoke earlier about, you know, getting rid of a magazine altogether and the uproar there might be, or what would be the uproar if you completely stopped all your digital stuff? Would, would there be any? Would the business feel it more? It's a fascinating question, I think. Um, I don't think you can, in this day, I, I think, I don't think you can have one without the other, really. Mm. I think the digital stuff is regular, it's consistent, it's constant, and it supports what then goes into print it, mm. gives, it gives you regular communication with your members so yeah i i, I don't see as i don't think I, I think they all fall under that one bracket of member communication mm. um and i don't think you can have one without the other Absolutely. i think they i think they they, they just play those different and complementary roles mm. so i think you know people these days talk about um uh lean back content and lean forward content if I remember rightly. Um, so a magazine really is where you lean back. So you're sitting back and you're mm. having a, you know, you're getting absorbed in the information that someone is giving you, um, which you haven't had to go and ask for. Mm. It's, you know, it's feeding you that. So it's, it's quite a relaxed, uh, 
sort of thing to do. Um, and the kind of lean forward stuff is when you're going out and you're looking for stuff. So digital is far better for that because you, if you want the answer to a question, you want that answer at that very mm. moment in time. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about you want it on your phone, don't yeah. you? You know, instantaneously. Um, and digital is fantastic at that. So, you know, we by by balancing the two together, you get the get the whole picture. Mm. I agree. I agree. So uh, going back to print, um, what do you think? organizations should avoid you know should they focus on um creating content that the members are, are going to enjoy and that should be the primary focus or should it be more about um looking internally and, and and sort of showing the members um what's going on in within your organizations i think i think if in terms of things to avoid i don't think there's i, th I think the biggest thing would be to not be selfish with with your with your with, with your content don't no one wants to get a membership magazine which is purely selling mm. the thing you know the reason that they get a magazine is because you've done that bit they've, they've decided to join and invest their money for a period of time um and and make you've got to avoid making decisions based purely on what you want to achieve as a business and and, and what what the members wanting that's the most important thing mm. for me so avoid making those those decisions in house without any sort of awareness about what your customer base are going to want to read because mm. you know people who are members of a professional body aren't you know they're doing it for a reason you know they want to get some benefit they want to elevate themselves they want to be better in their careers or be recognized mm. so you know they're not fools you know you know they know why they're spending their own money or they've gone to their their company and said I want you to reimburse me for this amount of money because I'm going to get this so yeah, don't be selfish with with what it is you're putting in there, and don't mm. certainly don't turn it into a you know a commercial magazine which is just full of you know you you open most other you know Men's Health or GQ first thirty pages ads. Ad adverts. Um, I don't think that's what you can do. I, I think there mm. is a revenue generation opportunity with a magazine, but you don't want to you don't want to kill it. Absolutely. I think that's sound advice. Um, so what advice would you give Paul to someone who was starting out a magazine? Uh, starting out? For their um, membership organisation. I think you've got to start with the members. You've got to really get into their heads mm -hmm. of the different groups of people and what they want, the different segments of the market. Um, yeah, uh, like Tom was saying earlier, you know, salespeople, it's, it's mm -hmm. all different. There's different groups of salespeople. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same in uh, resource and waste management. There's people that want different things. So it's, it's, you've got to be sure that you're getting that balance mm -hmm. of content right, um, uh, right at the start. I think it's, I think it's relatively basic. I mean, the actual workings around it is, is as you know, is, is, you know, it, pretty pretty severe pretty savage when you actually have to put together or relaunch a magazine but it's it's basic sort of business acumen i think what what why are you producing a magazine firstly mm -hmm. who are you producing it for and what are they going to want what's going to interest them to to when it comes through the door to actually pick it up or set aside some time to actually read through it what you know what do your corporate partners want what do your individual members want cpd is a huge thing at the moment so is there enough content in the magazine to help teach people and and give them some learning that they can actually say you know this magazine i know that four times a year i'm going to have four six eight hours worth of cpd mm -hmm. so that that makes it worthwhile for me to, to 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 continue doing it and i think you know i think it's a if, if, if you're going to launch a magazine you need to know who you're launching it for mm -hmm. and if you launch it for your own organization i think that's probably a mistake I think you, I think it has to be launched for the members, and it has to include content and information that is is genuinely going to help people. Mm. Excellent. Well, I think that's really sound advice from both of you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, it's been a fantastic conversation yeah, and really very fascinating. Yeah. And uh, well, I hope to have you on again sometime. My pleasure, so, anytime. Um, Tom Overly, Paul Sloggett, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Tom. Information overload.
childhood is filled to failure. I'm so sick of being told something changed right in front of their eyes. Enough is enough. Like, I'm not getting worse from this point. How are the guys at Barcelona training? How are the guys at Man United training instead of just staying in the bubble? A growing number of big brands are communicating with their customers through podcasts, helping engage on a whole new level. Podcast listeners create strong trust with brands through podcasts. 76% of UK listeners have acted on a podcast ad. Listenership is growing across all age groups, notably in young adults aged 15 to 24, with around one in five now listening to podcasts every week. Growing statistics like this prove that podcasts are a medium not to be ignored. So, what's stopping you bringing your brand to the conversation? Yeah. River Sounds is a division of the River Group. We work with companies globally to create and distribute original podcasts to augment their branding and marketing efforts. We leverage existing content, such as blogs and social media, to design, plan, create and distribute high-quality podcasts. We focus on creating podcasts to increase brand awareness, aid in customer education and help support customer retention. It's time for your brand to make some noise. River Sounds, bring your brand to the conversation. conversation.